Been a, uh, uh, it's been a journey for me. I, I've said that uh, every person should write a book, uh, not because uh, uh, you know it's it, it's anything but an extraordinary task, uh, but it, it makes you reflect upon um, why you're doing what you're doing and what you believe in and why you believe it. And uh, that's really what this experience has been for me. It's been an incredible experience for me to. Uh, uh, to sit down with some of um, some of the people I respect tremendously, uh, some of them from here at ISI, uh, in particular, and he was sitting over there. He's now coming back. Um, uh, the, the gentleman who was uh, uh, my editor on this project, Mark Henry, uh, you know, challenged me at every turn, as well as Jeff, uh, on occasion when he would drop in from the uh, from the business world and and uh, sit in on some of our uh, our, our group discussions. Uh, challenged me at every turn uh, to dig a little deeper, and it was uh, it was very very helpful to me, and uh, something that um, hopefully made this a better book, uh, but um, at least from my perspective, made me a better senator and and a better uh, public servant. So uh, I appreciate the tremendous um, contribution people of of ISI. People have asked me, you know. Uh, you're a United States Senator, you're in, you're in leadership and all these things, you know, why did you get this obscure publisher from Wilmington, Delaware, <coughs> who's never had a best-selling book up until now? Uh, uh, I said, well, I wanted to be the first, and then in a lot of other places I wouldn't. Be. No, what I said was is because, um, you know, they brought something to the table that, uh, that no other publishing house uh, imprint would do, and that is they brought uh, an intellectual force and a worldview that I had in common with them that would help me plumb the depths of, uh, of why I do what I do. And uh, so it, it was a, a tremendous collaborative effort and uh, the folks at ISI here deserve um, you know, a, a, a big, uh, certainly debt of gratitude for me and, and a big uh, um, a part of the success of this book. So I want to thank you, Jeff, for actually calling me at a parking lot in a nursing home in Chester County. At the time, I was sitting in, outside in a parking lot in a nursing home on my cell phone, and Jeff called and said, why don't you write a book with us? And uh, I said, well, I'm late for a meeting. I've got to walk in here and go to this meeting. And, he, and so he, that didn't slow him down at all, and uh, he, uh, he made the pitch, and we agreed to do it, and uh, it's been a, a great collaborative effort. So, uh, so thank you all very, very much for, uh, uh, for making this tremendous contribution. And let me thank my colleague, Mike Castle. Um, he obviously must be safe in his re-election if he can spend time with a senator from Pennsylvania on a beautiful uh, <laughs> afternoon and, 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 and waste all this good time to be out uh, doing, doing uh, fundraising and campaigning. But it is great to have you here, Mike. Thank you for honoring me uh, by, uh, by coming by and, and, uh, and, and listening to, uh, to what I have to say, although you may have gotten the times wrong and you thought you, I was actually done speaking by the time you got here. I don't know. But if I... If I mix up your schedule, I apologize. You've got to sit through this now. Um, and he's sitting in the front, so he can't sleep out. He's tall, so it's, it's not one of these things he can get out of this. Um, let, me, uh, uh, let me thank all of you for coming by and for your support of ISI and, and obviously by being here for support of this project. Um, you know, uh, I listened to what Ken had to say, and Ken really did provide a, uh, a thorough summary of how I, how I view this book. Um, Interesting, uh, he, he focused on, on the left and, and how they've responded to this book. And um, it's uh, very gratified, candidly, at, at, at some of the response, uh, in particular uh, from those who have read it. Uh, you know, the first people that got their hands on this book prior to the publication date uh, were the news media. Uh, the news media got, got, got their hands on this book, and, and particularly every Capitol Hill reporter. Uh, was able to uh, to find a copy online or, or at Trover's Bookstore, which is right off Capitol Hill on Pennsylvania Avenue, and uh, they uh, they went through as well as the Democratic Senatorial Committee and and dug through this book trying to find gotcha quotes, and uh, I'm actually amazed that out of 440 pages, they've only been able to find four such quotes that 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 they saw as as as, as fodder. Um, but the interesting point was, aside from those articles, is when I had the opportunities I had on many occasions to talk to some of my colleagues in journalism, uh, none of whom agree with me politically, at least um, 
not from their writing that they agree with me politically. I've asked them the one question was, what did you think of the book? And the most common response I get uh, was a, uh, uh, summed up in a, by a reporter who writes for Reuters. And she said to me, I don't mean to be offensive, but it really just was, was a bunch of good common sense. <laughs> Now, only to a liberal with, some, with saying something common sense is offensive. Uh, I, uh, I said, well, that is, in fact, the highest compliment you can pay, uh, a, a book on, on public policy, on, on how we need to, to, uh, to reorient America. Um, you know, it is, it is a book that I think is very much about common sense because, of course, what conservatism, as Ken laid out, is about is about taking the best of the traditions that we've had in America, things that may put them in a place of importance in our home, and so it should be with the values and traditions that have made America great. Uh, I had a gentleman come up to me afterwards and says, you know, it's not just those things that still work are valued in prized possessions, even things that don't work as well as they used to uh, still are valuable still teach us lessons that we need to learn and, and, and impart on us uh, a historical perspective that can teach us as we move forward. And so what, in a sense, some may say, well, parts of this book are outdated, some of this is you know, retro, some may say that it's controversial and that it tries to hold on to, uh, to a different era in, in American life. Uh, I fundamentally disagree. Uh, I really believe that these are truths and truths are true and don't change uh, because the date goes from one day to the next. Now, these are, these are truths that have served America and served all societies that have abided by them very, very well. They're very basic truths that the foundation of any stable and good society is one that is built on faith and families. And we know that. We say that. And people who read this book say, oh, this is just common sense. Yet do we live it? Do we enforce it? Does our public policy reflect it? Do our laws reflect it? Do our uh, cultural artifacts that we produce and show our children reflect it? Do our educational institutions teach it? And the answer to those things, by and large, increasingly is no. And yet we, we, we accept them as true, but we personalize them and privatize them. And we don't do anything to have those reflected in the public square. That's the mistake. It's not that we've abandoned these principles. It's not that a liberal can't read this book and say, you know what, as many have, I agree with most of what's in here. Or you've made me think about things of what's in here. What, what we've done is abandon the field. We've turned too insular in our beliefs and are afraid have been cowed into not expressing them in the public arena and fighting for those principles as truths again. And hopefully this book, if it will do anything, will encourage many not to be afraid to be controversial. I have, every time I sign a book, I shouldn't say every time, lots of times when I sign a book, the, uh, someone will come up to me and say, uh, can you put your favorite verse of the Bible? And mine, of course, is be not afraid. And, and, I, and I really do believe that's a message for all of us who seek the truth is to be not afraid to proclaim that truth. Be not afraid to go out and say what you believe is true and fight for those principles in the public square. That doesn't mean we will win, but it means that we are holding true to what democracy is all about, which is a battle of ideas. And uh, I really believe that this, if this book does anything, it will reinvigorate that debate. It will show that those common sense things that we've all held on to internally uh, have impact if we don't hold on to them externally. And they have impact on those who aren't raised in families that have some of the same um, luxuries, if you will, that most Americans have. The reason I wrote this book, as Jeff and Mark will tell you, is I wrote this book to focus on those who are on the margins of our society. I wrote this book to address what I saw was, a, was an abandonment by conservatives of those who are in need in our society. And it was an abandonment of the worst kind. We, not only did we say to, uh, in, in the public policy arena, that um, we had no ideas of our own, 
but we tacitly went along with the other side's idea, the left's idea, this place that you don't find in nature, uh, uh, ideology, uh, that, that we were going to help the poor by inserting more government and more control of people's lives from on high. And we went along with that with one caveat. We were courageous enough to say, well, we'll spend less than they will. And that was our idea of conservatism, liberal ideology with a smaller price tag. Uh, that, to me, is a period of time in American uh, conservative history that we should be ashamed of. And it wasn't until the mid-90s, and I, I'm glad Mike is here because he deserves a lot of credit for the work that, I, that is, forms one of the basis of the sections of the book, and that's the welfare reform proposal that we put forward in 1994. In the contract with America, we had a small working group in the United States, United States House when I was a congressman. And it was the first real conservative attempt to turn back the great society, to, to say, no, these ideas, not only shouldn't we pay as much for them, they're wrong. They hurt people. They didn't intend to hurt people, but they did because it's an ideology. It's not common sense. And so we put back common sense things like people need to work to provide for their family. And we need to have fathers more involved in their children's lives. And we need to build up communities and social capital. Those were the premises by which the 1994 and eventually 1996 bill that was signed, and Mike was on that working group and provided invaluable uh, contributions as a former governor of Delaware would to the understanding of what we needed to do on the federal level. But that was the first real attempt, and I think we have taken off since then. And now, remarkably, we are the party of ideas. We are the party that are putting forth a whole variety of different programs to nurture and support the family. Ideas like initiative that the President and I have, have, have authored called the Marriage Initiative. This fundamental precept that is so important to our society, and that is the children need mothers and fathers in stable relationships to give them the security they need in a world that is not a secure world for a little child. And that security of mothers and fathers being there to support them is something that government cannot afford to be neutral on, much less, as it has been in the past, on the side of the breakup of that couple. And so the president has put forward a proposal that is controversial, and that is that when a mother and father have a child out of wedlock, and on the day we ask them this question, who is the father of the child, which we do as a result of the 1996 welfare bill, on that same day we ask an additional question, are you in a relationship and do you intend to marry? Believe it or not, 80% of such couples answer the question yes, 80%. But within a year, only 10% are still together. Now, can government afford to be neutral? Can we afford to sit on the sideline and say, we have no interest in this relationship? When we know from every statistic, and I lay them all out in chapter and verse, that we know the children in households where that 90% will be in a year's time will not do as well in school. In fact, they will do far worse in school. They will not do as well in the economy. They will, not, they, will, they will be much more likely to have sexually transmitted diseases. They will much more likely to do drugs. They were much more likely to, to be convicted of a crime. We know all those things, and we know them by overwhelming, overwhelming statistical evidence. And so can we say, in all honesty, can common sense dictate to us that we should simply do nothing? And the answer, of course, is common sense is no. We should do some common sense things like, can we help? Can we provide some money to, to a pastor or to a counselor or to someone to help you get through one of the most difficult times that you will face in your life? And that is trying to build a relationship while trying to raise an infant. That's tough work. That's tough work for a married mother and father with a first child or second child or third child. It's impossible. It's impossible or nearly impossible if you're not. And so these are the kinds of things that are in this book and I believe are, are vitally important for us to begin the dialogue and debate. Uh, I tackle a lot of controversial issues in this book, controversial in the sense that people disagree with me. But I believe that they do reflect the, the traditional values and morals that have built this country and made it great. It comes down to the fundamental question as to where, where are we headed as a country and what worldview is going to succeed. In closing, I say at the beginning of the book that when I was a student at Penn State University, I, 
I really believe that liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, had the same view of America. In other words, what a good America looked like. After my years in politics, I don't share that viewpoint anymore. I don't believe that they see America the same as I see America as a good America. In brief, I, see, I think that the left sees America more like France or Holland as the good, or Sweden as the good America. And I see America, well, as America, as the country that de Tocqueville came and wrote about in the 1830s when he talked about how different we were as a country after our revolution than France was after theirs. And that France's revolution was one of people seeking to be free from oppression. It was a freedom from. And America, we didn't want a freedom from our obligations. We didn't want a freedom from tyranny. We wanted a freedom for something better. We wanted a freedom for our community, our families, something that we could build upon, something positive. We were an optimistic people who understood the power of community and the power of family. We wanted a freedom for reaching for things that we couldn't because of the oppression that we were suffering under. It was a fundamentally different kind of freedom. And it is a fundamentally different kind of freedom that we're talking about in America today. A freedom for, a conservative view of freedom, as opposed to a liberal view of freedom, which is a freedom from all restrictions, restraints, a freedom to do whatever I want to do, what I call no-fault freedom in a society where we have no ties that bind, we have no commitment to our neighbors, we have no moral view that we have to come together and, and, and provide a unity of purpose in this country. No, it's a freedom best defined, as I do in the Planned Parenthood v. Casey case, a freedom to divine one owns, one's own concept of existence of human life, of the universe. That is not our founder's freedom. That is not a freedom for something higher. It's a freedom for our base instincts that drives us to a country that will not long survive under those auspices. So that is the core of the book. That is the reason I wrote the book. And I want to thank everyone here at ISI uh, for all the work that they did in allowing what was somewhere down in here and probably in other places and other people uh, to come together into this, into this document and hopefully will add to getting back to a freedom for something great in America. Thank you.